It is a great privilege and joy to be able to focus our attention upon the nations and how indeed, in spite of the challenges uh, health-wise, that the fields are white into harvest and there is a rich harvest taking place throughout the world. And so we look forward to telling the story of what God has been doing over these past months. Uh, we've been thankful for Josh and Anna Kari and their, and, uh, their friends Ruth and Amy and, uh, and their sharing that was so encouraging. We're so very grateful for you taking the time to come and to share with us what the ministry has is, is meant to you. Uh, and, and so we do rejoice locally what God is doing, but we also rejoice at the various ministries that we have really on six continents through, uh, I don't know, Tom said 20, do we have 25 missionaries, is that what he said? And uh, uh, I knew we had a lot, but I didn't think we had that many. But anyway, we're so grateful for, uh, for the Lord's blessing. Yes, thank you, I do need that. <laughs> thank you, Fred. Um, and, and so we do look forward to what the Lord has for us this month and we seek him and, uh, you know, familiar Bible verse, uh, probably most every Christian's favorite verse is, is John 3.16. And, uh, and so, you know, sometimes we can take it for granted, you know, and, and just speak it so glibly without really pondering deeply what it really means. And so, you know, I believe in seeking um, the Lord to motivate us with regard to praying for and loving the world that this verse will be a tremendous help to us. So I'd be grateful if you would recite it with me. We can probably all do it, but we may have a little different translation, so we'll just read it uh, off the screen that's here. If you would be willing to recite uh, this verse with me. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you that you are the living God who's not only created us and, and all things, but that you also providentially rule over all things. And you rule through uh, your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal son of God become flesh who lived among us uh, and, and faithfully obeyed all of your commands. Uh, died upon a Roman cross, rose again, and is now seated at your right hand to rule and reign amongst his enemies. And so, in spite of the fact that we see so many that defame and de defame your name and want to overthrow your rule in this world, we do rejoice that uh, though the wrong seems off so strong, you are the ruler yet. And so we do lift up our eyes off of our own circumstances, off of the circumstances around us to that one who is ruling and reigning on the throne and the one who loves the world. And we pray, Father, that you'd made, motivate us by your Holy Spirit to love the world, that you would warm our often cold heart towards other people, that you would warm it, melt it, and give us a love for those around us because as foolish as and as rebellious as so many might seem, they really don't know what they're doing. And so instead of our scorn, I pray that you would fill our hearts with love and, and mercy towards them as our Savior has taught us and demonstrated and, and other believers throughout uh, the scriptures and history. So Father, move our hearts towards you that we might see the Lord Jesus ruling and reigning and because he is ruling and reigning, we can indeed love the world too now. Please motivate us to your own honor and to your own glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we do rejoice in this particular verse from God's word that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's a verse of such enormous encouragement and vision, and we definitely need, we decidedly need his vision for loving the world. What's perplexing about the verse and is often just 
overlooked is the fact, how can God love the world so kindly, so graciously, and yet there are those who still do not believe? And the Apostle Paul speaks of it as the mystery of iniquity. We don't, we can't begin to fathom why there are those who, who resist the love and grace of our, our God and do not believe because the promise seems to be so all-encompassing that there is that mystery of unbelief. And the perplexity of this verse is demonstrated in another verse that the Apostle Paul gives us in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. For to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust the living God who is the savior of all men but especially of those who believe. And so there is a division that's there that leaves us with that mystery of unbelief. On the other hand, the glory of those who are given the gift of faith to confess their sin and to acknowledge God's grace. Um, but you see, it, 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 it involves suffering on our part. Paul says we both labor and suffer reproach. So it's, it's, it's too glib just to say, well, God loves the world. He loves all people. And so, uh, you know, if anybody really wants to come to the Lord, they, they can just do it. They can just believe and they'll be saved. And in spite of the fact that there's so many Christians that would believe that, the question is, why not make an investment that involves your labor and also suffering reproach. Jesus came into the world and he loved all those that he came into contact with. And how do they reward him? By crying out, crucify him, crucify him. Let his blood be on us and on our children. And they killed him. I mean, stunning, shocking. That God so loved the world that he sent his son into the world and what do we do? We killed him. It's good news, but it's a sad response on the part of this world. And so it's a mystery. And so I, I, I want to reflect upon this mystery that involves us in, in loving also. That if God so loved the world, and we say we worship the living God, then we too must love the world. Because if you don't love those around you or you don't even pray for or ever think about what's going on in the rest of the world and to pray for them and to sacrifice and, and to give and of time and, and financial resources and whatever in order to minister the gospel, how can you say that you're worshiping the living God who loves the world? Are you not worshiping a parochial God that just loves you, your family, and whatever you're interested in? And that's about the extent of it. Is that not an idol? Is that not a God of your own creation? And so as a congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are by definition a missionary organization to love the world. That's what we exist for. And so often congregations can, can um, push missions in evangelism and outreach as a ministry of the church, but not the ministry of the church. We exist to love the world, period. It's not an add-on. It's not something we do in addition to the rest of our program, but it is our program in every ministry of this particular congregation is to demonstrate the Lord's love for the world Indeed, the scriptures go on to tell us that uh, in John the Baptist, when he introduces Jesus in John 1.29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I mean, that's very expansive. That's very inclusive. And so, again, we are faced with a mystery, uh, mystery of faith. But the Bible tells us clearly not all have faith in 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 and 2. And uh, 
We don't have verse 2 on the screen, but I'll, I'll just read it to you, or you can look it up yourself as you wish. But finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. There's a cost. For not all have faith. In, in verse 2, that, that isn't on the screen. But uh, not, the Bible tells us not all have faith. So, I mean, that's our common experience, isn't it? Matter of fact, we meet a lot more people who don't believe in the living God, who know nothing of his love, and rebel against his commands and against his rule and lordship and would overthrow it if they could. Um, you know, that's pretty much our common experience. And so we see it in the scriptures that not all have faith. And in fact, Jesus is a stone of stumbling in a rock of offense in, in, uh, in 1 Peter 2, 9, or 2, 2, 8, I'm sorry. A stone, of, um, Jesus is a stone of stumbling in a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. And in the Old Testament, it's equally true he, that uh, our God, our Savior, will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel as a trap and a, a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Just pry, try praying in a public, secular place in the name of Jesus and see what happens. You, you can pray to God all you want, but as soon as you say, in the name of Jesus, all kinds of anger and ire, you know, because it's so exclusive. I mean, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that is a stone of stumbling. It's the only way to know God. That a God, that a, a person who says that he knows God and that there's many ways to God is lying. And it's a blasphemy. And it's a rebellion against the living God because there is only one way to know God and that is through his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see this mystery of uh, the in inclusiveness of God's love for the world, his provision of salvation for the world, but yet the mystery of unbelief. And so that's what we want to focus on uh, this morning. And we trust that it will give us a vision. As we ponder it, it will give us a vision for our month. And we pray that God would revive our hearts. You know, we've found over the years, I mean, it, we've never built it this way, but it's been true that, that uh, our missions month is a time of revival for us. So, I mean, we don't build it as a revival and, and um, but it, it is a time when the Lord renews and restores our love for him by renewing and restoring our love for our neighbors and for those in our community and co-workers and those throughout the world. And so I pray that that would be its impact upon each of us, each of you upon myself. We desire to love him more. And so we need to back up and look at the scriptures and see how does it teach us that God has loved the world. And so we see, first of all, that God loves by his temporal provision for every person upon this earth. That he, uh, he provides as the Apostle Paul, when he was ministering uh, in, in really his very first uh, stop on his first missions trip, and he, he's proclaiming um, there was a healing, and so there was this great miracle that was done, and so all the people wanted to worship Paul and, and Barnabas. And so the, Paul's response is this. This isn't the whole thing, but in Acts uh, 14, verses 15 16, men, why are you doing these things? Why, why are you worshiping us? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God, to idol, from idols that you make with your own hands, to the living God who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. That God allowed for centuries nations and peoples to serve their idolatrous idols. And he tolerated their rebellion, their 
hatred for him and allowed them to continue to walk on this earth, upon his earth. And he endured them with patience, with gentleness. I mean, if you stop and think of it, when God told Adam and Eve, well, when he told Adam, he says, in the day that you eat of this forbidden fruit, you'll die. And so it's a wonder. Why didn't Adam die? We'd had a really short Bible, wouldn't we? <laughs> if, if, if that was the end of the story. But God in his mercy didn't end the story there because he made the promise that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent it's at some point in history. Now, we don't know how many millennia that was into the future. But uh, uh, the Lord overlooked and, and uh, allowed history to continue. And he tolerates so much wickedness and vileness and filth and perversion in our own nation that we're still here. I mean, growing up, I thought our nation was so bad, I never thought I'd make it to the age I am today, uh, at least without Jesus coming back or doing something. Uh, because the, the, the hatred for God, at least in my corner of the world, was, was so great, I couldn't see how we could continue. But yet, you know, I've, I've lived all these decades now, and the Lord has spared our nation over and over and over and over again because he's not willing that any should perish, as we'll come to in just a minute. But he provides. He allowed sinners to go on for bearing their sin. I mean, Paul says it again in Romans 3.25. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously com uh, committed. He, he passed over them. And so he pours out blessing upon blessing that he, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, Matthew 5, 45, that, uh, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. That does not mean that God's judgment doesn't rest upon those who defy him and want to overthrow his rule and despise his name and take it in vain and all the rest. Because Jesus has compassion upon those who are under his sentence of wrath and death. We see it in the case of Jerusalem itself, as Jesus rode on a donkey into Jerusalem uh, at, during the triumphal entry. And it's uh, such a dramatic scene, you know, how he came down around, um, um, I don't know, down into the valley of Jezreel, and then, not Jezreel, um, it, it's escaped me. He comes down in the valley and then up into Jerusalem. And uh, while he's coming and riding, just bouncing along on this donkey, right, he is just weeping and pouring his heart out, out of grief, as we read about it in Luke chapter 19, verses 41 to 44. Uh, now, as he drew near to the city, he saw the city and wept over it and said, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you. To the ground. He will level the whole city to the ground, and he's done that. And that happened in 70 AD. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, which is true, because you did not know the time when I visited you and it was the day of salvation, and you rebelled against it. And so he weeps over it. He weeps over those that will be judged one day. And again, we read it in Ezekiel chapter 18, that God has compassion on those headed to eternal judgment. Uh, Ezekiel 18. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, keeps all my statutes, and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him. Because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways? He says he has no pleasure in it. And again, we read it in, uh, uh, well, we'll go on to John chapter 12. And, and one of the things that so impresses, amazes me is that when Jesus went around and washed all the disciples' feet, and he came to Judas, and he didn't bat an eye, and he washed Judas's feet. 
knowing full well that Judas would betray him. And we see it there in John chapter 12, John chapter 13, verses 2, 2 through 5. And supper being ended, the devil already being already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. He did it for Judas, knowing full well Satan had already entered him to betray him. And so he has compassion on those who are under judgment, whom Jesus had already said that, uh, um, woe unto that man who betrays himself. We're told to go to every creature in Mark 16, 15, that um, as Christians, we're to go to everyone, not those who we think will believe, but to those who we can't even imagine ever coming to faith in Christ. But he said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, to every creature. And it's not up to us to decide, you know, who, who's going to be saved and who isn't. Uh, reconciliation is offered to all, Colossians 1, 21 to 23. I'll let you read that on your own later. But Jesus says, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What's the qualification? Are you burdened? Are you laden? Are you laden with guilt and perplexity and confusion and trouble? Will you come to me, Matthew 11, 28, come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my burden is easy, and my, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And so he makes it, a, it's to everyone. <laughs> Whosoever thirsts, let him come. Are you hungry spiritually? Then come to me, Jesus says, John 7, 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. It's an expansive invitation to everyone. Um, and Jesus promises in John 6, 35 to 37, that whoever comes to me, I will in no way cast out. And so we do not decide who's going to be saved. The Father is the one who decides who will come. But yet our responsibility is to go, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now notice that we're to go and we're to make disciples, not just converts, not just someone who just agrees that they're sinners and they need a savior and then they just go on as they were living. No, we're to make disciples. That's why we do this through Christ church because that Christ church is the most effective way to make disciples. That doesn't mean he doesn't use a lot of other means as well, but ultimately it's the church that has the responsibility to conserve those who believe. And so we're called upon uh, certainly to do friendship evangelism and to be as gracious a neighbor and to love and to care for other people because friendship and love do build a bridge. But ultimately no one comes to Christ because they're impressed with us. And so we're constantly pointing to Jesus. They come to, they come to Christ because they're impressed with Christ. And that's our responsibility is to glorify Christ, to exalt him, to point everyone to Christ. Just as Paul, he says, don't, don't, don't bow down to me. It's Christ who is, it is the Savior who, who died. So we're to love our enemies, Matthew 5, 43 to 48. Uh, there will be those who will hate us. And uh, as uh, one book from years ago, my friend, the enemy. Anyone that's our enemy, in a certain sense, is our friend, because at least they pay attention to us enough to be mad at us and to cause us trouble. And so what's our responsibility to, to, but to love them? But you've heard it, there was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So the Lord is calling us to do something that we can only do by his grace because it's not my inclination 
And most likely it's not your inclination to love those who are despitefully using you and, uh, and reviling you and saying all manner of evil against you. But rejoice because the Lord is working through you to, uh, to reach them for the gospel. So we're commanded to love our enemies. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, Romans 12, 17 to 21. And, uh, and so, again, this is against our nature. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And so we, we look to the Lord. He's the one that, that will transform and change people. And I have so many stories that I wish I could tell you, but, and some, some of you already heard, but, uh, uh, but they still are amazing to me how God has transformed enemies right, right in front of believers. Uh, Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Uh, we forgive as Christ did from the cross. We read in Luke 23, 34, where Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And they divide his garments and cast lots for the one thing that he still owned up to that point. Our enemies do not know what they're doing. Again, we read in Acts 3, 13, 17, and 20, um, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance. Can we be that tolerant even with those who hate us and want to use us and revile us and say all, terrible, all sorts of terrible things about us? You know, we need to grieve more than be angry. And that doesn't come natural to me anyways because he sent Jesus Christ who was preached to you before. We see it again in uh, um, 1 Corinthians 4.12 where being reviled, we bless. And so we'll go on to Stephen. You know, Stephen, uh, the first deacon, or one of the first deacons, was stoned in Acts 7, verses 54 to 60. We see, uh, you know, Stephen's prayer when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. And he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. That's very important. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Astonishing. Is this my future? Is this your future? Is this the church's future in our own country? Are we able, by God's grace, to pray that same prayer? And see, what's important to recognize here is that Christ is ruling and reigning because he answered that prayer with one person, Saul. And he, and he transformed Saul uh, into the apostle Paul. And all the rest, as far as we know, went to hell. Is Christ not ruling and reigning when he sends people to hell, as well as when he saves them, as he did the apostle Paul? I know that's a tough question. And the answer may be something we resist. But the fact of the matter is, when it comes to salvation, it's God who's sovereign. And I praise God for that. And so we read Paul's own testimony in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 8, and 9. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And so what does the Lord call us to do? You know, as a individual, as families, as a church, he calls us to follow him. And he will make us fishers of men. I am so thankful for this verse because I was a young pastor and, uh, you know, I heard, uh, you know, famous speaker speaking. And, uh, you know, because, you know, I, I had a the theological degree and I mean, I thought, I mean, I had the best education 
in ministry that you could possibly have. And the Lord had guided me all through my life. And so, so you know, I was rolled up my sleeves. I was really ready to go. And, uh, and the Lord had persuaded me over a short period of time that uh, as far as I know, no one ever came to Christ because of my theological arguments and expertise. I mean, I've looked back over it. I mean, a lot of people have come to faith in Christ, but, but uh, I'm just as mystified how they came to faith in Christ as, as they are, you know, because ultimately it's God's mysterious work to give them the gift of faith and to receive Christ. And so my job is to be faithful, which I have attempted to be all these years. So it's not that I wasn't faithful. It's not that I didn't give good reasonings why people should come to faith in Christ and reach out and do everything I could humanly do. Well, not everything, but, but you know, at least I tried as best I could. And, uh, and Christ rewarded that with, uh, not rewarded it, but, but he, he used my life, my testimony, to bring people to himself. And I don't know, I got this one funny story that you've all heard before, so I won't tell it again. But uh, anyway, you know, that Jesus says, follow me. Uh, our focus is on obeying Christ. Uh, we are to love unbelievers, to be patient, to be compassionate, and it's his job to save them. And so the sovereignty of God is still wrapped up in this verse, that God is sovereign in saving those whom he chooses to save. And what a relief that was when I first heard this verse, because I thought I could manipulate people into the kingdom. I could talk them into it, and I could, I don't know, do all kinds of things to try to coax them into the kingdom. And I got over that in a hurry, that that isn't the case. Because just like Peter with the, with the uh, you know, when he was called upon Luke 5 to cast out his net, he said, oh, we've been fishing all night. And he was an experienced fisherman. He said, I didn't catch a thing, nothing. But at your word, he went out again and cast his net in, and there were so many fish in that net, they had to call all the boats from the shore to help pull that, that load in. And so Peter fell down amongst all these squirmy fish, saying, depart from me, I am a wicked man, a sinful man, and you are not just a carpenter. You're the son of God. And so that's the wonder of ministry. That's the joy of being in ministry all these years, is the wonder of seeing what God has done. And at this stage in my life, in having allowed everyone else to take responsibility, that, that's my role in life right now, is to give things away, you know? And so it's a, it's a wonder because the Lord is doing so much more through those that I've given it away to <laughs> than, than he did to what I had the opportunity to do myself. He is sovereign. He is the Lord. And so we rejoice in his sovereign grace, even as we read in Acts 13, 48, um, that uh, now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as have been appointed to eternal life believed. They were appointed by God to eternal life. And so what a relief, you know, I don't have to, I mean, I can, share, I can lead people to water, so to speak. You can't make them drink, you know, only God can make them drink. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, you know, we can do our very best and it's important that we do our best. But on the other hand, ultimately it's the Lord. And so we bow before him and say, depart from me. I'm, I'm an evil man. Thank you for choosing to use me. God saves those whom he chooses. Again, 2 Thessalonians 2.13. So, um, but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God from the, very be from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And so this, this is the wonder of it all. And, that, and it's like being the midwife or something. I mean, you know, what, what is your responsibility at the birth of a child? Just to make sure the baby survives, you know? <laughs> I mean, you're not delivering the baby so much as I don't know, maybe you are, but, um, <laughs> but, but it's more a matter of just being in awe of the miracle that just took place, that this child was born and you had something to do with it and it's still alive, and that's great. <laughs> and so, it, you know, really it's the wonder of being in ministry. It's the wonder of seeing God's grace up close and personal 
God's sovereign grace frees us to minister to everyone because we don't have to guess who's going to believe. And the people we most, we think will not believe are the ones that end up believing. And the ones that we thought would be easy, you know, the blinders are still there and they just don't get it. So it's just a puzzle. And so God saves, saves us from trying to manipulate people. Proclaim the truth, love your enemies. God saves. That's our vision and purpose as a, as a congregation is to love the world to his own honor and glory. And I pray that he would revive our hearts and commit ourselves and be willing to sacrifice and to honor him in order to uh, minister the gospel on every continent except in Antarctica. <laughs> Please pray with me. Father, thank you so much that you are our Father. Thank you for the joy of serving Jesus. Thank you for being a part of your wondrous plan. Thank you for being a part of a congregation that's eager to love the world. And just pray that you would renew our energies and our strength, that we'd not be uh, weary in well-doing. And just pray, Father, that you glorify your name in Jesus' name. Amen.